uh, last talk before lunch by David Tank, who's going to talk about place cell dynamics during navigation. Okay, uh, great. Um, I uh, would like to echo uh, what Neil said, that it's a great honor uh, to be here in the celebration of uh, Jim Ronk. And uh, although I, my sort of intellectual background and, and laboratory training really didn't intersect either with uh, his lab or um, John O'Keefe's lab, um, nevertheless, I uh, was influenced enormously by some of the work um, that we've heard about already this morning. And um, you know, I come from a background primarily in developing uh, new technology for large-scale recording and imaging, optical imaging, fMRI, things like that. I was at Bell Laboratories for a number of years. And I came to, uh, went to Princeton in around 2000 and started to uh, think about um, the possibility of uh, doing some work in the head direction cell system. And so you know, it was both uh, my colleagues and I at that time were enormously influenced by uh, this fundamental work that's already been described, I guess first in 84 and then later in 1990, on head direction cells. And you know, as shown here, um, they have a, the head direction cells in a sort of circular environment, uh, you know, a cylinder with a cue card, have a very, very um, stereotyped uh, response property, namely they uh, fire in this sort of um, uh, head direction of sort of um, uh, as a function they, they fire as a function of head direction in the, in the, in the environment, and they have this sort of triangular function, uh, which is shown here in the, in the bottom right as really one of the first examples of the quant quantification of this system. And you know, we became interested in you know, studying it from the point of view of, a, of an integrator, and we've heard about path integration before. I had actually worked in, in uh, ocular motor system integrators, and I was interested in perhaps studying the head direction cell uh, integrator. Into where the idea was it could integrate vestibular signals into a head direction signals, perhaps even in the absence of sensory visual stimuli, for example. And so thinking about that, um, my colleagues and I, and this was Anton Kabaz and uh, Tom Edelman and Forrest Coleman, thought about um, building the following apparatus, which was um, an extension of earlier work on tethered insects that had been done primarily in Germany to the head-fixed rodent. And so um, about in, you know, in the early 2000s, we developed the first spherical treadmill uh, for head-fixed rodents. And, the, uh, and when we first started thinking about applying it to the study of head direction cells. So the idea was that we were going to put this spherical treadmill that's shown over here, sort of an air-supported uh, styrofoam ball, and the mouse was on running at sort of the North Pole, head, and the head was fixed. And the idea was we were going to actually put that inside of one of these cylinders, you know, the, 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 the cylinder that you've seen in all the previous, previous examples. And we were going to actually motorize the, the cylinder, motorize the, the head fixed apparatus so that we could be in the driver's seat, so to speak, and study the head direction cell system with and without visual stimuli. And um, this is some of the work that uh, we did at that time. This was Anton Kabaz's uh, experiments. And so here are, this is from basically um, uh, micro drive or microelectrode uh, recordings of head direction cells um, in the anterior dorsal nucleus of the thalamus. And you know, on the left hand side, you see sort of the traditional uh, triangular firing field of uh, head direction cell in the free case of it sort of walking around in the circular environment with a cue card. And on the right, that was, this was the response um, of the head-fixed animal as we were in the driver's seat rotating this apparatus back and forth relative to the cue card and then recording the properties, uh, firing properties of that head direction cell. And um, you know, we saw these beautiful triangular functions. This was kind of the very first example of the use of a sort of an artificial environment, so to speak, um, in the study of uh, navigation system in head-fixed rodents. Now, over the next several years, um, other people came to my lab, and we ex really uh, extended greatly this basic idea through the development of virtual reality systems for head-fixed rodents. Um, some of the first work uh, was done uh, by Chris Harvey. Uh, this work is shown at the top, where we combined the spherical treadmill head-fixed rodent with a screen that surrounded um, the animal, and we measured the rotation of the spherical treadmill as the animal ran. We had a lick tube positioned in front of the mouth, and through instrumental conditioning, we could train uh, mice to run, for example, back and forth along linear tracks, which were projected through a you know, computer uh, projector, uh, screen projector, onto this sort of mini IMAX theater that was kind of surrounding uh, the rodent. 
And um, this was uh, useful both uh, uh, for um, recording with extracellular electrodes, which uh, is shown in kind of the upper right here, and also it allowed a platform, it facilitated the ability to do intracellular recordings um, using a, a whole cell patch electrode techniques from play cells during, and so these were some of the very first experiments, I think they were the first experiments, of anyone recording intracellularly from a play cell as it ran through a place field. We were able to sort of characterize some of the characteristic underlying intracellular dynamics at the level of membrane voltage. Dan Dombeck, who came to the lab around that time as well, um, had more of a background in optical imaging, as, as I did as well, and so we sort of used this platform for, um, for uh, the spherical treadmill and the head-fixed rodent and virtual reality to actually now combine that with the emerging field of imaging calcium dynamics uh, large scale through uh, two-photon imaging um, through um, a cranial window. And so using that, we were uh, able to demonstrate optical imaging of place uh, fields. And this is sort of down here as an example of, um, you know, these four traces are different neurons that were optically recorded as this mouse was running down a linear track. So it's optical recording of place fields. Now, um, this is sort of the, then the, hint, the, the connection, I think, to Jim's work. And through head direction cells really got us into the spherical treadmill and into this, from the spherical treadmill into this other, you know, these mechanisms for studying place cells, grid cells, and so on, using virtual reality and head, and head fixation, facilitating different kinds of measurements. But most of those experiments really did not kind of take advantage of the actual virtual reality aspect of it. It, it emphasized the recording technology. And I want to uh, spend the rest of the talk on a different kind of application of virtual reality and, and end with a, a mostly unpublished work um, by, um, uh, by Dmitry Aronoff, a, a postdoc, uh, has been a postdoc in my lab for a number of years. He's now moving to uh, Columbia University as assistant professor um, this, uh, this winter. So I'll start off with some of the early work he did and then move to the more recent unpublished work. So it starts off again with a virtual reality system. This was for rats now, and it is a body tethered virtual reality system. This is kind of the system that uh, we put together. Um, it again consists of a spherical treadmill as shown here, air supported, in this case, very large diameter styrofoam sphere. It's surrounded by a conical inverted cone kind of display screen. There's a projector from the top, monitor the uh, motion of the sphere with two um, to optical mice that are located around the um, equator of the sphere. The animal is actually held at the North Pole, so to speak, with a tether. There's a tetrode recording, a commutator that allows the electrical signals to be connected to the external world. And then virtual uh, environments were projected onto the screen surrounding the animal. So this is not a head fixed preparation. This is what we call body tethered virtual reality system. Using this system, um, it, Dimitri found it relatively straightforward to um, train the animals uh, to do a number of tasks that have normally been done in real environments. So for example, a random foraging task where instead of sprinkling a little you know, uh, chocolate drops around a real environment, Dimitri would train the rat to uh, navigate to kind of invisible targets within this virtual environment. And, the, and if the animal did, it correct, uh, uh, did end up going into that zone, it would get a water reward through a tube which was uh, located, uh, again, within licking distance from the front of its mouth. Similar, there was a target pursuit task uh, shown at the bottom. Now, um, then, the, of course, the question is, are, do, is the navig are the head direction cells and grid cells and place cells, are they actually active and engaged in some sense in this task? And, and so in a, a large group of recordings that Dimitri did, he showed first of all that there were place cells, uh, or sorry, that there were uh, grid cells um, that uh, in fact were from two or three different modules with different spacing that were um, observed or could be recorded in the medial entorhinal cortex during, this, during this, these sorts of virtual navigations. And also, as shown in the middle panel there, uh, head direction cells shown in these polar plots look very similar to uh, those recorded in a real environment. And, and border cells uh, that we just heard about, uh, more about from, uh, from Neil, and, and also the traditional place cell. And, um, and so that was sort of our first you know, inkling that these animals were really engaged in the virtual reality environment. But of course, I mean, I think all of us 
believe that the animal knows it's not in a real environment, it's in some weird apparatus, but it's, you know, just like when you play a video game, you know you're not really, you know, in the environment that, 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 that you are, that, that the game is projecting, but, you know, uh, so, what we, so it wasn't so clear whether or not uh, these cells would really respond in the same way. The system was engaged in some sense in the same way. And so um, here, this was an experiment that was really uh, important for us, for our thinking, in, uh, for, the, for, the, for the work I'm going to sort of end the talk with. This was an experiment where um, Dimitri changed the actual um, virtual environment projected onto this conical screen surrounding the animal, and, but changed it very, very slowly. Okay, so in fact, if there was, let's say, a square rectangular environment, you're now looking from the top in the top view, and here, very slowly, over a period of like 30 minutes, this virtual environment would rotate 360 degrees within the real world environment. So the animal could still see, you know, little cues of the projection system and so on. So the question is, you know, would the play cells and grid cells and so on, really, would they kind of lock to the real world or would they lock to the, to the virtual world? And um, I won't go through all of the evidence, but basically in these panels below, it's shown that both place cells and head direction cells, they actually followed the rotation of the virtual environment. So place cells, when you, when, you, um, when you calculate their firing fields relative to the rotating frame of reference, you see nice place cell firing fields. When you, when you do that same calculation relative to the laboratory frame of reference, you, you know, there's weaker spatial information. Similarly, in this, uh, as you can see in the, in the, in the right-hand plot here, um, head direction cells, they just, you know, the, the, the preferred direction just rotates 306, just keeps, you know, rotating around and around as the environment is rotating around and around. Okay, so, so why was this important? It was important to us because I think, you know, it, it provided further evidence in our minds that these animals were really locked into this kind of extremely unnatural um, uh, virtual environment and that we started, you know, at the time that we were doing these experiments, we started thinking, wow, if they're really so engaged in these sorts of kind of virtual environments relative to a real environment, could we actually exploit that, that sort of engagement in a way that would probe more this issue of what is represented in the hippocampus and the entorhinal cortex? And so now I want to turn to that, which is the main part of my talk, which is navigating in a non-spatial and you know, I'm going to get fined, I guess, for this, but uh, cogn in a non-spatial co so-called cognitive space. And this is work that um, was, has been done over the last uh, two years by Dmitry Aronoff and a very talented undergraduate uh, in my lab, Rhino Nevers. So the basic idea is what you know, you've heard about already several times this morning, is that one, there are sort of two or more views of uh, hippocampal function. One is that, uh, the one that we've primarily heard about, is that the, they have a sort of a, a cognitive map of space. And so the place fields and grid cells and head direction cells this morning so far have primarily been, um, been interpreted in the context of this view. Um, so, but there are all the other views, and I think we'll hear more about that actually later this afternoon, that, that these sorts of systems could be involved in more general aspects of cognitive function. And then going back even all the way to Tolman, so early experiments, that one, you know, maybe one should think more broadly about what the term cognitive map means. So for example, if you, a human navigates through a sort of an environment of different chords, what would be the spatial representation, what would be the representation rather in the entorhinal cortex or in the, um, uh, in the hippocampus during such navigation? So we set out uh, at least to uh, try to do that in a simple form um, by the following experiment. And so the idea was that this, this rat, and we're gonna be recording from cells later in the hippocampus and entorhinal cortex, would press a lever that lever um, would activate a trial, begin to activate a trial. The trial starts with the um, presentation of a, of, a, of a tone, of an auditory stimulus at two kilohertz. And the longer that the, um, and here's a movie, by the way, of a rat doing this. And the longer that the uh, rat presses the lever, the frequency of the tone increases. And the idea is that through instrumental conditioning, we were going to try to train the rat to, in some sense, navigate through this sensory space 
of uh, auditory frequency to a target zone that's shown in green. And if it released the lever at that time, it would get a water award. So, so um, that's the task. It's kind of a lever pressing. We think of it in this stage as kind of a one-dimensional navigation along a sensory, continuous sensory dimension. By the way, the, the uh, sounds are presented on a logarithmic scale because that's, uh, you know, there's a lot of evidence that's the way that uh, they're represented uh, in the brain. Now, importantly, not every and the animal gets a reward if it does that successfully. Now, importantly, um, uh, in the earliest experiments, they were done, as you see in this movie, and so the animal was sort of free to walk around in this apparatus, but, but in, the, in, the, in the rest of the work and, uh, that I'm going to show, actually, there was a no the, the animal was trained to stick its nose in a nose port and to press the lever. lever. So there is no walking around in the environment during the, um, during the, 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 the collection of the data <sighs> that I'm going to, to show you. This was basically a, it's not head restrained or head fixed, but the animal is, has its n head in a nose port during the recording, uh, during at least, you know, the lever pressing part of the, of, of, the, um, of the experiment. And importantly also, I should have mentioned this, the rate of change of frequency relative to the pressure put on the lever was changed on a trial by trial basis. That way, the total amount of time that it took for the animal to reach the reward zone would be different. In fact, it was varied over a factor of two in time. Okay, so this, is, uh, this slide um, sort of shows the qualitatively and quantitatively, the, um, the performance. And what's shown here is uh, time along the horizontal axis and trial uh, along the vertical axis. And um, each blue dot uh, represents a measurement of the frequency of the sound stimulus when the lever was released. Okay, and on the left it's plotted as a function of frequency on a log scale, and on the right it's, it's uh, plotted as a function of time. And, I, and, and the yellow, by the way, represents, uh, the yellow um, highlighting really represents kind of being in the correct reward zone. And so, as you can see, um, the, the, uh, in the histogram in the upper left, there's a, v a very tight um, distribution of lever releases at the frequency where the animal is just entering the reward zone. Whereas if you look at this as a function of time, um, actually the distribution is much broader um, across animals and across experiments. Um, that is shown uh, on the right-hand side where uh, for each experiment, and uh, which is gray, and each animal, which is uh, shown in, I guess, red, um, the, the coefficient of variation of this histogram, both for frequency and time, are shown co-plotted, and as you can see, the coefficient of variation is much lower, meaning, uh, for frequency, meaning that the animals are really, in some sense, releasing the lever at the right, and when are in the right frequency zone. Okay, so now what happens, so now this is the behavior. Now what happens when you look at uh, recordings in the uh, dorsal hippocampus? Well, this is recording now, this, is, uh, this represents the recordings of, you know, uh, somewhere between 500 and 1,000 neurons, and I'll explain in a minute. These are all recordings uh, done with tetrodes, the technology that John and, and uh, Bruce and others uh, really developed, the, tech, the microdrive tetrode recording from the dorsal hippocampus. And, and, the, and, they, and each cell here has been, uh, has been plotted on this, uh, in this, has been plotted in this graph as one line and um, color coding the uh, firing rate of that uh, neuron normalized to the peak and sorted by the peaks in time relative to the behavior. Now, as I said, all the, all the trials are different uh, lengths. So these have actually been time, so the, the, each trial was time warped to a standardized duration and then average. And we can we'll talk more about that in a minute. But here's what you find. You basically find a lot of cells that are active, right, these are, these are you know, now pyramidal cells, presumably, they're complex spiking cells in, um, in uh, dorsal hippocampus, they have theta rhythms, they show ripples, they, you know, everything. A lot of them are active right at the lever press. Some of them are active, as you can see here, during the, uh, between the, the time between the press and the release. This is when the frequencies are changing. And some of them are active right, a lot of them are active actually right at the release of the lever and, um, and the intertrial interval. So here's an example of many trials and recording of a cell that was active right at the very beginning. Um, these have not been uh, time warped. 
but they are, orient, they are aligned from the shortest trial to the longest trial. And you can see that um, there's a very, very narrow firing field right at the uh, onset, and there's kind of a broader firing field after the release of the lever. Um, here's another neuron. This, one was, this neuron was active during the, um, the sound frequency changes. If you plot it as a function of time, which is shown on the left, you know, it seems to take longer to become active and be broader for the, uh, for the longer trials. But if you plot it as a function of log frequency, there's a, there's a place field, a firing field, um, at a particular uh, frequency of 10, in this case, around 10, 10 kilohertz. Uh, here's another cell which had a very, very tight firing field right at the end of the trial, at the, at the, at the end of the uh, lever release. So now um, let's look at some of the cells that are active during the sound frequencies. Here um, we take the, uh, what are shown, you know, sort of, I guess, eight different cells that were active at different time points during the trial. So each color is a different cell. And we sorted the trials into sort of fast trials and slow trials, and then, and then did time warping independently on the fast ones and the slow ones. That's why the time scale is different in the top and the bottom. And you can see that these cells fire in a sequence as the, as the trial, as the, um, as the animal has to spend longer and longer time in order to navigate to the correct reward zone. And the fields become broader. Now you might be interested in, what, interested in what's happening in MEC during these, uh, th these experiments. And so here is the z same kind of experiment performed, you know, same recording, same kind of behavior, but with the recordings done in uh, the dorsal medial and cortex. And uh, I'll be talking about grid cells and border cells and so on in a minute. This is just if you take all the cells recorded and look at them ordered across time. And what you can see is it looks kind of similar to what was observed in uh, in entorhinal court, in uh, hippocampus. There's some, a lot of cells that are active right at the beginning of the lever press. There are a bunch of cells that become active as the animal is navigating in the sensory uh, across this uh, auditory space. And a lot of cells, a huge number of cells, are active right at the end of the release of the lever. And again, here's some examples. Very sharp, very tight firing field from this cell right at the beginning of the lever press. Here's a cell with multiple firing fields. One at the very narrow one at the lever press, a broader one midway through the, tr the navigation through sound frequency, and then kind of a, a very broad one, which uh, seems to be in kind of the intertrial interval. And then here's another, here's a different cell from the region right near the release of the lever, where there's a very, very tight firing field. So um, let's look at some of the properties of these cells. What about the number of firing fields? Well, the number of firing fields actually is not that different. Um, between what before compared to what you would see in recording an animal in a real environment. So in hippocampus, you know, here's the distribution number, you know, one, two, three, and four. Again, there a lot of cells have uh, one firing field, but there are also cells that have two and three and so on. In MEC, um, kind of like what you see in real environments, they typically have more firing fields in these um, in this sort of uh, non-spatial cognitive type navigation task. Uh, furthermore, the field density is kind of what, what I showed you before, both for CA1 and MEC. There are more cells that are active right at the beginning of the lever press and the end of the lever press than during the middle, but there are cells active throughout the entire. They tile the, the, the behavioral time, the, the whole behavioral time. And, and, and I think as you've seen uh, in, in many of the examples, the field widths are very narrow at the lever press. They're wider between uh, the levers, press and release, and again, narrow uh, during the release. So the next question is, um, you know, is this really navigation or are they just responding to sound? So if you, if you record for these cells and you just look at the, um, uh, you do the experiment the traditional way that we, I just described, but you then actually record from these same cells during passive playback of trials. So the, the animal is hearing the same frequency progressions and so on, the same, but, and then the question is, does it respond to those frequencies? The answer is no. Okay, and measured, you know, we did a sort of mutual information measure between firing rate and either um, uh, the, um, the, in, the information rate, the uh, mutual information between uh, the firing rate and the sensory stimulus, both for the case of active and passive, uh, active navigation and passive playback. And as you can see by all the red dots, the, 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 they really only care, they only carry sort of information about the active task. And, um, you know, basically uh, what you will find is that, you know, if you look at the cumulative distribution, um, it's very obvious there's just a, a dramatic separation between the blue 
which are passive, and the red, which are active. We also looked at a case where, um, by the way, the, the auditory stimulus predicted when a reward would come, but the animal didn't actually have to do anything to, 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 to produce that reward. And in that case, it was an intermediate level of representation of the sensory information. Now, one thing you might want to know is, what are the, how do these cells relate to place cells? And so Dimitri did a number of experiments where he recorded from these neurons and then recorded from the same neurons, just took, it, took them off the virtual reality uh, system or this lever pressing sort of virtual reality system into a real arena. And so here's an example of a cell which had a, a place cell uh, which, which was recorded in the, in the hippocampus, which had an acoustic place field, but it had no um, space, spatial field in the real environment. Here's a neuron with the opposite, right? It had a beautiful place field in the real environment, but it had no response in the acoustic environment. Here's one that had both. It actually shows sort of, you know, one beautiful uh, place field in the acoustic environment as well as, as the um, real environment. And here's one that had, you know, here's a cell that had, uh, had neither. And so if you look across the whole distribution, and look at information rate about either sensory uh, acoustic stimulus space or real space, they, you know, they fall into these quadrants where the red ones have more information about uh, acoustic environment, uh, or rather about spatial environment, and the blue more information about acoustic environment. And if you look at, as shown in the upper, upper right here, sort of the distributions, you know, 23% of the cells that were recorded had, um, had uh, acoustic fields but no spatial field, 8% had both, um, or sorry, this is the total, this is the number of cells. And then uh, let's say 24 had, um, had um, spatial but no acoustic. Anyway, it, if you actually look closely at this, it seems close to independent um, draws with replacement that Bruce was talking about, but not exactly. There are basically too few with both fields and too many with one or the other. So there's some kind of separation uh, relative to independent draws. Now, what about grid cells? So, well, here's an example. This is um, a recording of a grid cell in, a real, in the real environment, and that same cell during this uh, sensory navigation task. You can see that there are multiple fields and um, um, uh, so on. The, these two cells uh, in the upper left were recorded, they're from the same module, and they were recorded uh, at approximately the same time. You can see that one has beautiful fields um, in the acoustic task and the other doesn't, which is kind of an interesting observation. Um, border cells um, also have uh, firing fields in, um, in this uh, acoustic navigation task, and, and we looked at other non-spatial cells as well. Okay, so I'm just gonna end here um, with uh, one other thing, and that is um, that we are now trying, you know, one of the natural questions is, I should have mentioned this, do these things, do these grid cells, do these multiple fields really correspond to sort of a trajectory through a hexagonal lattice, right? And uh, as uh, my colleague Ila Feed and I, and, and Sam Llewellyn, who's here, uh, showed, um, this, is, this is sort of true for, for the way grid uh, cells respond navigating down linear tracks in real environments. The question is, does that occur in virtual, uh, in these virtual environments? We don't know the answer to that. But I just want to end by, uh, we're still looking at that. But I do want to mention that the final thing we're trying to do is actually get this navigation task working in two dimensions. Okay, and so I just want to mention that this is work done by this undergraduate, Rhino Nevers, and what he's done is actually train rats to actually navigate in a 2D space of loudness and sound frequency from initial positions around the perimeter of the square into that green reward zone, does so by navigating using a two-dimensional joystick and move in two directions. Um, here's a video of a, of a rat actually navigating in this 2D space. You can see this. This is where it's actually moving in the sensory space. So it moved from up here, then it actually misses the zone and then moves back and and, and, go, and, and navigates over to the reward zone. And, and you, know, you, you can look at these and you really, if you look at the uh, trajectories, you can see that the animal is actually navigating to these reward zones. So that's where we stand now and we're currently doing recordings to see what place cells and grid cells and head direction cells look like in this 2D environment. We don't have the answer to that yet. So um, to conclude, I just wanna say it, these experiments seem to suggest that you know, CA1 firing fields can represent an arbitrary non-spatial coordinate and they, the cells seem to be repurposed between spatial and non-spatial tasks. And I, and I want to um, say, of course, that this work really is just adding 
to the large body of evidence being produced by a number of other labs, including those you'll hear about here from later today, on the representation of non-spatial dimensions in the hippocampus and MEC, including time, social space, and visual space. Uh, and with that, I just, uh, oh, I, I just want to end with, kind of, what is that, wh how, wh what do you think about when you think about this at this point? So, look, I don't know the answer, but what, what we try to think is in the same way that one thought about the uh, hippocampus is producing a, producing a sort of cognitive map for navigation in a spatial environment, maybe in abstract non-spatial domains, there's kind of a manifold of activity that exists in the hippocampus and the MEC, and that the and that behaviors actually correspond to parametric sort of time trajectories across, along this manifold. But exactly what you see and how it represents the, um, the environment it could be space, it could be time, it could be frequency. It depends on the behavioral relevant variables that went into the creation of that manifold. Of course, that's just a conjecture, but it's kind of the way that we have been thinking. Uh, and with that, uh, I'll end. Thank you. Thank you, David.